we're going to be recording this call. That's fine. Okay. All right. All right. So we're uh, we're recording. A, I'm in a laptop. <laughs> um, this is the first uh, a virtual meeting I've had the chance to do. So Nathan, thank you very much for uh, enjoying to be on the the show, as it were. Um, just looking to kind of do the classic thing around uh, providing some folks with re, uh, an introduction, kind of you know where you've come from, how you got in the business, um, and and what you're up to now. Yeah, so thanks, Rob. Um, I think I prefer to be in your Jeep driving around so I don't have to look at your face. For <laughs> <laughs> thanks. The Jeep would be better. Uh, but no, so my story is a little bit different, I think, than most, but I'm like pretty much all serial entrepreneurs. Uh, we take advantages of situations when we see them. Uh, I joined uh, Government Landscape Services back in uh, 2006 after spending about 10 years in the ag business working with dairy farmers. Um, back in 2006, we were around a $5 million landscape company. And uh, over the last 14 years or so, we've grown it to you know three branches between 12 and 14 million in sales, uh, depending on the year. Um, and yeah, uh, I still don't know a lot about landscaping. I try not to learn that part of it. I stick to the business side and the people side. Um, and then about five and a half years ago, I took the things I learned and actually spin off a consulting business as well. So now I work with landscape contractors across Canada and how to improve their business, uh, focusing on strategy, people, and finance, those three areas, um, getting really clear on, on their business uh, so that they can enjoy the fruits of their business. Um, because many people have gone into business because it's an opportunity, um, but some have struggled to understand their business from a financial standpoint and sometimes just a lack of clarity. So, um, because I was new to the landscape world from the farming world, I had to learn it myself. And so uh, it's been fun to share some of my experiences over the years. That's cool, man. I really appreciate you kind of bringing the, the audience up to speed. Um, you, you mentioned that, um, well, first of all, congratulations on growing, you know, Gelderman. That's a huge um, milestone for, for any company, uh, let alone a landscape company. So way to go. You're obviously doing something right. Um, and then on the Southbrook side, you mentioned the idea of strategy, people and finance. Um, you know, from my experience with entrepreneurs, there's lots of uh, conversations going around, you know, finance, whether they're good conversations or not. I mean, that's debatable, but um, still a topic that people uh, are aware of HR and team people, that type of stuff also. But strategy seems to be a bit of a funny thing, um, whether it's strategic planning or defining a strategy. We, we did a session today, um, marketing in times of uncertainty, and I spent quite a bit of time around strategy because I think it kind of gets a bit of a bad rap. It doesn't get the attention it deserves. So can you speak just a little bit um, to what strategy is from your perspective? Well, for me, strategy is pretty simple. It's basically the roadmap to give get to from a, point A to point B. Um, just like when you bake a cake, uh, not too many people wing it. They're going to have a recipe of some sort. And we all know that if you you know miss an egg or so, you might you know, the recipe might change a little bit or the end result. But strategy for me is simple is that you have to keep it for me on a one page document, not this fancy 20 page document that sits on the bookshelf collecting dust. And that's why people get so they get strategies like, oh, it's a big fancy word. I'm scared of it. I don't know where to start. And from, you know, and that's so for Gelderman, you know, I just took my example there was like they never, you know, Gelderman prior to me being here and for, for the first six, eight years, we didn't do any strategic planning sessions. We just got sales and did the work. Right. And, like next year got better. The problem is that when next year doesn't get better, it's far too late. And that's where you need sort of a plan to say, okay, um, what's our foundation? What's our core values? Uh, what's our purpose? You know, where are we heading? Uh, and then in the last few years with the market being so tough for finding people, your strategy helps with who defi defines who you are, right? And why do you exist? And to exist to make money is not the real answer of existing, right? That's you, hopefully the results of why you're in business to make money. And so with a strategic plan, it just helps you get on one page, it brings clarity to the business. It actually will bring your staff, your team closer together. So we're all driving for the same focus. Um, and it should happen regardless of good times and bad times. It should always be happening. Yeah, that's cool. So that kind of segues. I mean, uh, we're filming this on April 21st in 2020, um, kind of in the middle of the largest, you know, pardon my language, shitstorm I've ever seen. Um, so what are you seeing from the Gelderman side and, and the business that you're running, but also from the Southbrook side in terms of um, the people you're coaching and, and consulting with? 
Yeah, so on the I'll speak on the Gelderman side first because that's that's where I live every day. Um, you know, we had a strategic plan we did uh, beginning the our, our fiscal year starts April the first. We had the strategic plan completed in January, um, and we basically have to throw the playbook out or part of it, out, right? Yeah. So the core values don't change, our purpose doesn't change, our vision does change, and our strategic pillars or our action items have to change. We need a pivot now not to say well here's the plan we've got to stick to it and or 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 we'll just pause for a month and then go back to it uh i'm not pausing well we basically threw half of that plan out the window the last two weeks i've been creating new plans yeah creating new plans for our maintenance group and our landscape group um, we are in a position probably stronger after this than we were going into this because we've learned um you know about i've always said uh, when you have sales, sin, sales cover a lot of sins. And now when sales are gone, you see the sins like, immediately. And so we've gotten rid of sins that we was like, oh, I don't know, you know, we would justify it before. Mm -hmm. So our strategic plan for Gelderman has changed. It's pivoted. Uh, we'll be a smaller company. Um, I'm not sure by how much yet because we're only one month into this. Um, but I am planning for a, a downturn in the economy. At the end of all this, Consumer confidence, I believe, will be down. I'm not putting my head in the sand thinking, oh, everything will go back to normal. I don't think it will. And I don't know what even normal means at this point. Yeah. Um, so it's how do we plan, um, not for the worst case scenario, but but not for the rosy picture either. Right. So under the self growth model, then, you know, I, I share my resources. So I've been doing weekly Zoom meetings with um, uh, clients and 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 other landscape contractors. And I'm just sharing with exactly what we're doing here at Gelderman. But I'm advising, you know, to re to go back to your budget, reforecast, you know, a, a 20 or 30% sales cut. What does that look like? Um, is there any other services you can add or can you ramp up certain different services? Here at Gelderman, uh, you know, we do landscape design build and commercial maintenance. But this year, because um, property maintenance services is deemed essential, our landscape teams are now doing spring cleanups on residential homes where normally we would probably not have done that because the, the $200,000 landscape project would be just a better fit for us. But we can't do that. So are we just going to sit and hang our heads and wait or do we pivot and sell other things? Yeah, that's great. It's about pivoting on, on the fly and, and not just waiting for it to get better. I, I'd be long dead if I was still holding my breath. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time to hold your breath. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think it's really important to, shed some light too on that idea of the, of the pivot. I think a lot of people, so, you know, doing these town halls, we're doing a lot of them too, for not only our clients and prospects, but also um, through other, you know, groups like the entrepreneurs organization. Um, and the temperature of the room has changed quite a bit over the last four weeks. You know, first week was like panic, paralysis, overwhelmed, uh, denial was kind of like what was, what we were seeing. And then three weeks ago, it was like confusion um, just a lack of clarity on programs and what was available and what people could take advantage of. There's just a lot of questions um, and then anxiety and, and, you know, the denial was essentially gone. And then two weeks ago we started seeing people like, oh, I think I kind of got this new normal. I'm kind of on my feet. They're not just, you know, you know, it's, it's it. everybody's got a plan to like get punched in the mouth or the Mike Tyson mm -hmm. quote. Um, so they're getting up off the mat. And then, you know, this week and last week, it's been really like, okay, well, what do I do now? Like what step do I take? And we're starting to see a little bit of paralysis come back oh, really? and people don't necessarily know what to do. Now we're seeing stories of inspiration and people doing great things. Um, you know, the pivot you just mentioned is a great example of using your, you know, your core capabilities and skills um, on a, on a different focus, a uh, different type of market, but still similar in terms of what you're used to doing. So, um, you know, there's a there's a restaurant here in Guelph called Crafty Ramen, and they they they've been closed. So they're doing uh, DIY ramen kits, and they're selling out within like five minutes whenever they're available. So, um, you know, and and we've seen a whole bunch of uh, of other local stories and and international stories of people pivoting. The thing though, I wanted to get your take on is around testing these ideas because you know when uh, we brainstorm and we brainstorm with our team, you know, there's just a ton of great ideas come on the table, and it's like okay, well. First of all, prioritize. So how do you do that? And then second of all, if you have prioritized, how do you test it and kind of take a page out of Jim Collins where it's like fire a bullet before a cannonball so that you're not like wasting a lot of time and cash and resources going away that might not work out? Yeah, so on the Gelderman side, um, 
when it came to the spring cleanups of residential homes, we used to do this probably five, six years ago and gotten away from it. So we went back to those clients and say, hey, we can do this next week. You want us in? And they're like, yeah, um, can you go? We can go, right? So we had strive, you know, we, we had to go backwards in history to see what did we do back then? And then just start adding those component, those levels of service on. Um, on the on the Southbrook side, so you know, I'm looking at um, doing more outsourcing of, of services. Um, and currently Southbrook does bookkeeping and accounting and financial controlling type services for other landscape companies. And now it's like, okay, um, a lot of companies can't do this themselves or they want to hire back people or they want to know what the numbers are now. And so we, you know, we've been testing this model. We've been doing it for the last year, just a little bit, just behind the scenes type thing. And, you know, that's how the, it's a try for us. I would never want to invest tons of money and buy all kinds of new equipment and then say, let's go for it. Right. Uh, just reach out to their clients, ask them, if we could offer you the service, would you like it? If it was this price point, would you go for it? And that's how I've tested my assumptions, right? So um, the other thing was when we test our assumptions, I'll make sure, you know, I'll go through the list and say, okay, what's all the, the negatives, right? Where's all the cons to this? And let's not be, you know, let's plan for those setbacks, not think, oh, it's going to be rosy because I have a great idea. It's going to be fantastic. And you, you launch it and then there's no market there because you haven't prepared for those setbacks or those no's or people say, well, no, you're out of, you're out of mind, right? So <laughs> you got to have faith in yourself, right? You have to have full confidence and be convicted that you have a great idea, but you can't be an idiot and not contact your potential clients and say, hey, I have this offering. What do you think? Yeah, it's great. It reminds me of this story. I'm not sure if you've heard of Steve Blanks. He's uh, the founder of the Lean Startup out of Silicon Valley, kind of the grandfather of the Lean Startup. Um, he told this story at this whatever event I was at a couple of years ago. Um, and it was this idea that the, there was these researchers who had developed a, a solution to help farmers understand moisture in their crops. So whether it was too wet, too dry, or just right. So they developed a camera and they went to Steve and they said, hey, we got to build a drone so we can fly over these crops and then print off a report and show the, the farmer where they're at risk and, and where they can get more yield if they were to you know, adjust things. And he said, well, how, how, uh, how high up does the, the camera need to be in order to get an adequate you know, report? And they're like, about 35 feet. He's like, well, you don't need to build a drone. You need a 35-foot pole. Go walk through a couple of fields and then show the farmer the report and see if they want to buy it. Um, and that, that's always stuck with me because um, I think it's a great idea of like understand what it is you're selling and then see if you can test it without having to spend $250,000 building a drone. Yeah, that's been – I don't want to – you know, I, I can take on risk and and, and put money out, um, but I don't want, I'll try it the hard way first, right? So back in the day, you know, before we went to digital handhelds, we did the paper timesheet. If the paper timesheet did not work from the field to get somebody getting paid, the, the digital handheld would not make it any better. No, oh, yeah. Faster, right? So make sure that it, it actually works before you actually invest a whole lot of money or effort into it. I love that. Thanks, man. Um, so going on the people side, um, well, actually, maybe we can just touch on the finance side quickly. Cash flow projections seem to be something everybody's talked about, but very few people do or do properly. Um, can you speak to the importance of that, especially right now uh, for entrepreneurs and even specifically landscapers? Yeah, so cash flow is one of the funny things, right? You, you look at your profit and loss statement and think, hey, we made money, but where did the money go? <laughs> People say see profits on paper and then say I'm, I'm cash poor. Um, and so, you know, this is, you know, so cat, why is cash flow important? Well, it, it keeps everything afloat, right? So uh, cash is king at, at any time, but today's even better yet. Um, and so, you know, cash flow allows you to, um, you know, bankroll your, your payroll um, and to uh, take care of all the, you know, keep the lights on and your, your mortgage. I'm sure you can get deferred on some things. Um, so I've been doing cash flow statements for, well, I can't remember how long now, and we do it daily and have been doing it daily for years um, because I've always looked at, I'd rather use the bank's money than my own personal money. So I've always pulled money out of the business to invest in other things and made sure that I align a credit with the, with the company, with the bank, um, and that line of credit would fund the business and I would keep taking cash out of the business and invest elsewhere. So when you do that, you always have to watch cash. Right, you always have to watch watch your ratios on your balance sheet. Now, if you've never done that before, you don't know what I'm talking about. It, it, it's it's not something you have to worry about. If you leave all your money in the business and you keep all the cash in the business, great. 
for, you know, maybe, but I don't think that's good use of money. Um, when you don't have money, you watch the bank balance like a, like a hawk. You're always watching it, not because you're so you're just worried you're not going to make payments so you, or you have to not pay yourself or you have to go collect money from a client. Right. So we're always, you know, people who do cash flow statements or don't do it, they're still watching cash. Because at the end of the day, we all know when we when we can't make a payroll, we have to do something. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, you know, you know, cash flow for some it can be every day, could be every week, could be every month, can be you know two months, six months, a year out. In the landscape world, this is very difficult um, because we have seasonality changes. Do I know how much snow we're going to get in December of next year of this year? I'll say no. I have no clue. So how do I predict cash flow so far out when I have a change in seasons, I have a change in contracts? You go from a summer contract to a winter contract. It's totally different. Your the contract values can change. Um, so I, all I do suggest is that is before you get to the cash flow, make sure you understand where your numbers are, um, so that your your chart of accounts and your QuickBooks is is set up for a landscape company. So you you are predicting things like if you're going to um, pay insurance, are you doing a, a cash accrual? Or you're doing, you know, um, or you're sorry, if you're doing a cash, you know, statement, are you, you know, when you when you buy that premium, do you pay it all at once and, and ex expense it all at once, or do you expense it over the 12 months? And all these kind of things will help your cash flow, you know, understand where your cash is going to be. Um, but how do you pay for, for certain things, right? So I, you know, in this midst right now, the first thing I did when all this started happening, I called, I called all my vendors and got things deferred and discounts made in that first week um, before any of the government grants were coming out. Because I know if my sales dropped by 50% like it did in April here, because landscape instruction is not being essential. And so I had to um, make sure that I can defer as much of those payments as possible. Um, you know, so talking to my insurance provider, we just assigned our new premium a month earlier based on forecasted sales, knowing that we're not going to have those sales because of COVID. Why would I want to pay a premium on that? Something I'm not going to sell. Mm -hmm. So we've got probably a, on our liability part, we probably got a 15% discount. And yes. uh, because, you know, I might get it there, but I probably won't. Right. So again, cash flow is, is critical to know where you stand, but you have to have good numbers and understand what to put in the cash flow statement. And that's where people get scared. It's like, hey, what do I need to put in here? Well, it's every little thing leaving the company. Just this morning, we had purchased a couple of pieces of equipment. My Fifi of Finest thought we had, she had did not purchase it, but she stopped coming out of the bank statement today. She goes, I thought we we weren't going to buy it. But we changed our mind. We said, yes, we need it to, to help efficiencies. Right? So if you know things are coming out of the month, like every day we know what's coming out of the bank. I want to know what my cash is at the end of the day so I can protect every day going out. I love that. That's great, man. Um, but the key, yeah. is, the key, what I'm finding with a lot of people is that they don't realize, like right now, it's actually easy to keep cash in because you're not spending anything. You're stopped spending. But what people are doing, they're paying their staff and burning down their receivables and their cash. So as you're collecting receivables from, say, February, March, they're using that to pay for staff to do something now. But in the landscape world, once we get back to work, especially on the project side, the insulation, you're going to need the cash in to pay for your supplies, um, your labor. And, and we all know that when you have a business, growth takes cash, right? Yeah. Doing more takes cash because if you're, if you're spending a deposit you got for a client right now on holding on to somebody that you have not decided to lay off, what, what will happen when you actually need that money when you don't have it? So I believe, well, that, I believe a lot of companies are going to have a, a, a major cash crunch um, but a month after they start working. That's a really interesting point too, right? The, there's a thing called the cash conversion cycle, um, you know, and the idea of like how long does it take somebody to go from a quote to cash in your bank? Um, sure. And that and that 70 days or whatever days, um, you're spending cash to get the money in your bank account. So <laughs> I think what you said is really, really pertinent. Um, for the, you know, then it reminded me, just, it reminded me of the idea of, uh, what is it, uh, revenue is vanity, Profit is sanity and cash is king, right? right. Um, so just a quick note, and then we'll wrap up just for the sake of time, um, around people uh, and specifically around leadership. You know, if there is a, a tip that you could provide, you know, entrepreneurs and leaders out there um, from your perspective, 
of something they can do to help manage this either for themselves or their team, um, what would be one of the things that would come to mind from your perspective? Well, it's funny thing is what I'm going to say is something that we need to be doing anytime, not not in this pandemic or anything else, right? And and I know myself, I'm up and down a little bit like a yo-yo sometimes is that I get distracted with things. And But you guys stay close to your people. When I say stay close to your people is... is it's a little think, ironic, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't even stay close to them, but is, is find out how they're feeling, how they're doing, right? So um, here at Gelderman, you know, we have multiple locations. Some staff have been laid off. Some are on a reduced hours. Some are working full time. Is you know we thought how do we bring all this team together? And I and I saw a, um, a clip on a friend of mine sent me about uh, a, a general in, in Afghanistan a bunch of years ago where he had seven thousand people in a Zoom meeting. It's all his troops across the world were on one call every day. And so starting two weeks ago, we started this every day at five thirty. I meet with our whole team on Zoom at, and. And it's voluntary, so not everybody has to join on. Um, but we've been communicating far more through this um, than ever before, and we're closer as a company than ever before. So we do a, a Zoom meeting, and you know everybody joins on. We talk about you know how your how your day has been. Um, we've actually started doing employee highlights instead of doing, you know, uh, yeah. So somebody yesterday spoke about you know how long they've been with Gelderman, what why they joined, what do they do, what do they don't like doing. Uh, and then that person nominates the next person for the next day. So they picked the next guy. So this guy this afternoon is going to be explaining himself. So it just gets a camaraderie thing. Uh, today is called Tackle Tuesday. So what are we going to have for dinner tonight? We all share amongst each other. So it's nothing to do with the business, but it has to do with culture. And so in our line of work where we have, you know, office staff, managers, and field staff is a whole different variety of people here. Um, it's been really fun to bring this whole, the whole team together. And then I give updates on COVID, what, what's happening out there. Um, you know, what are, what's our stance? What are we taking? Um, and so, again, you know, the, the sum of that all up, as a business leader, the key thing is to, to know your people. And my wife's been um, taught me years ago, you know, how do you show love or how do you spell love? It's spelled T-I-M-E. You spend time with your people, just like your own children or family members. You don't buy them stuff. You spend time with them. And that's what the staff is no different is that, I got to spend critical time with certain people um, and it has to be very intentional. So now, you know, you got to be close to your people because your people in, in a, through a time like this, the, the teams will rally together or crumble, one of the two. And if you treated your staff in the past like a, a liability, they will crumble. If you treat them like an asset and you invest in them, they'll rally together. Awesome, dude. Um, so just a quick note on the, the Southbrook piece. Uh, you mentioned something about a program you've been piloting. Can you give us just a 20 second rundown of what that looks like if someone wanted to reach out? Yeah, so Southbrook uh, Consulting offers outsourcing of uh, finance, finance and accounting um, and HR services. So I have currently right now companies across Canada, we do uh, general bookkeeping, uh, to payroll, to CFO uh, analysis, everything in between. On the HR side, uh, we offer you know uh, recruiting services now uh, we're doing um, uh, health and safety um, policy development um, all the things that we've done at Galderman we're offering to other landscape companies and so many companies they either don't like the back office stuff uh, they don't they're too small they don't have the ability to hire a full-time person to do something on say you know job descriptions and employee evaluations and termination pay letters stuff like that um, or in on the finance side is that they're scared of it. It's like, I know I'm going to make money, um, but you know I can do the invoice, but then what about everything else? All right. So we've been doing this for about a year now, just very uh, subtly, um, but we're looking to ramp that up in a big way. Yeah, it's cool. What I love about it is um, it's the expertise in the uh, very specific business type. You know, I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot of bookkeepers are great, uh, but they don't necessarily understand the landscape business. You know, a lot of HR folks are great, but they don't necessarily understand the landscape business. And I think... Uh, especially now with kind of what's going on and people looking to try to cut costs a little bit. Um, doing so with expertise, though, I think is the kicker, right? If you can bring down your costs, but bring in the expertise to kind of move you forward, uh, I think a lot of people are going to be um, positioned really well to do that. So I, I really appreciate you sharing uh, the tips today, but also that program. So if anybody wants to reach out, how do they do that? Uh, Southbrookconsulting.ca. 
or Nathan at consulting, uh, .ca, my email address. Awesome. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I got to run and we'll, we'll have it posted live soon. So thanks a lot right. for doing this, Nathan. Thank you, Rob. Take care. Okay, okay you too, man. See ya.